So, good morning everybody um, to this animal welfare intergroup and welcome. Uh, today is on the management on invasive alien species. Uh, these species have been introduced in the EU and have been listed on the uh, union list of IRS because of the negative impact they can have to the native biodiversity. This can lead to misinterpretation by the general public who then consider uh, those animals as past and deny the fact that these animals can also, of course, suffer like any other animal. So invasive alien species are also sentient animals, of course, whose welfare and well-being must be considered as provided in the IAS regulation, which is why today's uh, session is really essential. So today we are joined by Juan Perez Lorenzo. He's a senior expert at Natural Capital and Ecosystem Health from DG Environment from the European Commission. And we have also with us Kevin Smith, International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, Global Species Program, MSc Environmental Law and Conservation Biology. Uh, we'll still first listen to the presentation and then open the floors, of course, for questions and answers. And before, as usual, I give some practical aspects. The meeting, as you know, is streamed on Interaxio. This meeting will also be recorded and the video recording and presentation will be uploaded uh, on the Intergroup website afterwards. So before we start with the presentation, I wish to highlight that we will have two animal welfare related uh, files uh, today in the plenary. First of all, there is the motion for a resolution on improving AU regulations on wild and exotic animals to be kept as pest in the European pets. Union. Pets, or oh, pest, that was before, sorry. <laughs> as pets, of course, in the European Union through um, AU positive whitelist. And then the intergroup is also particularly glad about this short motion for resolution by petitions committee as the call for an EU positive list on pets is one of the intergroup's priority objective for this term. And then we have also uh, a motion for resolution on the protection of livestock farming and large carnivores in Europe, mainly the wolf, for example. So the intergroup would like to call on your help to vote against all amendments that aim at downgrading the protection status of large carnivores in the EU. Because, as you know, large carnivores are very essential to biodiversity and healthy ecosystem, even more essential in the current global biodiversity crisis. And the EU cannot implement the Green Deal if it votes to threaten biodiversity. As already discussed by the intergroup, coexistent measures such as fencing and guarding dogs are efficient as shown in several countries and studies where the number of wolves have increased while the number of attacks has decreased. Knowing also that the wolf could play an important role by uh, keeping the balance in the ecosystem so it would also need much less hand hunters than when we have the wolf, uh, important uh, animal for auto-regulation of the ecosystem of the forest. So farmers must, of course, also be protected and should be appropriately compensated throughout the EU for any losses to their livestock caused by large carnivores. So we don't forget the farmers, of course, not so the first presentation, uh, no, I will give the floor first to Mr. Juan Perez Lorenzo, who will present on the protection of EU biodiversity from invasive animal species and the welfare of animals in effective invasive alien species management. Um, Mr. Perez Lorenzo, you are there online, I hope. Yes, you are there. The floor is yours. You have um, 10 minutes time for your presentation. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to start uh, by saying yes, uh, you introduced me correctly and to say that I, I work here in this environment mostly on invasive alien species, mostly on the regulation that we have on invasive alien species. 
Uh, I would like to thank the European Parliament, uh, the Intergroup on Welfare and Conservation of Animals and Eurogroup for Animals for the kind invitation to speak here today. I would like to thank the European Parliament particularly for promoting this the pilot project that we'll be um, discussing in, in, in detail in a moment on humane management of invasive alien species. To give a bit of context, uh, this was a new pilot project uh, managed by the Commission that ran from 2019, late 2019, until a few weeks ago, uh, whose objective was to assess management measures for vertebrate invasive alien species especially those on the list of union concern. Uh, the project developed uh, was to develop materials to be used by competent authorities and practitioners in the member states and to disseminate that knowledge on manage management, humane management of invasive alien species uh, and raise awareness on this important topic. This project was implemented with the support of a contractor on, a, on the basis of a call for tender the contract was awarded to a consortium led by the IUCN, which is present with you here today. Uh, to remind, um, to recall uh, briefly uh, EU legislation and, um, and international agreements um, uh, that are norms that are relevant to, to the discussion here today. We have, I was mentioned briefly, uh, in the Union Treaty itself, Article 13 does state uh, that animals are sentient beings and that in implementing a number of policies, agriculture, transport, internal market and research policies, there is a need to pay regard to the welfare requirement of, of animals. So we have this, this broad framework. Then we have specific EU legislation like the leg hole trap regulation prohibiting leg hole traps in the EU. Uh, the habitat directives is relevant, the birds directive is relevant, we have a regulation on killing livestock uh, which talks about the need to minimize pain, distress and suffering when, when killing livestock. We have the biocidal products regulation, we have a directive on protection of animals used for scientific purposes. And then the, the EU is a party to the Bern Convention and to the Convention on Migratory Species, which also have things to say on, on welfare of, of animals, of course. But all, all, of these, all of this is very well summarized in the manual resulting from this project, in case you want to have more details about that. But uh, focusing now on the EU regulation on invasive alien species, uh, the preamble of that regulation, which was uh, which came into force in January 2015, highlights that managing animal invasive alien species may induce distress, fear, or other forms of suffering, even when using the best available technical means. For that reason, uh, the member states and any operators should take the necessary measures to spare avoidable pain, distress, and suffering of animals taking into account, as far as possible, the best practices in the field. Um, article 17 of the Regulation on Rapid Eradication and Article 19 on the Management of Widespread Invasive Species clearly state that when animals are targeted, they, are, they must be spared any avoidable pain, distress or suffering without compromising the effectiveness of the management measures. Mm, since the regulation came into force in 2015 and even before through many life projects, life program projects that dealt with invasive and species, we have learned a few lessons. Um, Managing vertebrate invasive alien species poses many challenges, especially when this is done over sustained periods, over long periods. Inappropriate measures may lead to lack of public acceptance, to opposition to those measures, and even in some cases to project failure um, because of, of public opposition. But, however, managing vertebrate invasive alien species is like any invasive alien species, is necessary 
because if action is not taken, uh, more often than not, cost and impact um, raise rise over time and, and become greater over time. So it makes sense to prevent and to manage. Some to share some considerations and conclusions, some reflections from the Commission side on this project. Um, we concur with the analysis that welfare impacts have to be considered when selecting and applying management measures. Welfare impacts must be monitored during the project application to learn from them. Uh, welfare impacts have to be evaluated continuously to develop and improve measures and reducing those welfare impacts. There is a need to consider the whole lifespan of the animals, for example, for those that are kept in captivity. Uh, importantly, humaneness of a management measure is not binary. You, we cannot say a measure is totally humane or a measure is totally inhumane, although some measures are, are of course commonly seen as inappropriate and should be discarded from the beginning. Uh, so we conclude that where there is a choice of equally effective measures, we must choose the most humane option, bearing in mind, of course, potential constraints given by costs, resources of or capacity. To recall some of the considerations in the EU regulation, um, uh, prevention is the preferred approach for all invasive alien species, not just for vertebrate IES. Managing or eradicating new populations should be done as soon as possible while the numbers of those species are still low and they have not established and spread widely. We should, as I mentioned, spare avoidable pain, distress or suffering when implementing measures and we should also seek to minimize impact on non-targeted species and their habitats. Now a few reflections on, on our opinion on the results of this project. We are very satisfied with the outcome of this project. It was successful, it was well managed, it was very interesting. Uh, it overcame all, all difficulties that came as a result of the COVID pandemic, even so it managed to implement things on time with good participation, so it was a success. Uh, the manual that it developed into uh, among other, other deliverables, uh, was developed by experts with input from national authorities, from experts of various walks, from a very good EU-wide consultation of experts in all biographical regions. It also benefited from knowledge on this topic from beyond the EU, and it reflects all this knowledge. Uh, member states and practitioners now, for the first time, have um, a compilation of useful guidance on how to incorporate welfare when managing, managing vertebrate invasive alien species, how to be effective, effective while incorporating those welfare considerations. Uh, the project developed very good materials, um, the manual, the brochure, species sheet, uh, so those should be further disseminated and I call on the people present here to help us further disseminate those materials. The project, uh, during the course of the project and the final conference that took place in July this year, it brought together a great number of stakeholders uh, and that was in itself a big achievement. As to the next steps, the Commission, um, given that it is a successful project with very uh, interesting useful outcomes we are considering of course how to how to follow up on this uh, because inter alias the science be behind management evolves of course uh, and so does the national legislation is changing all the time uh, so uh, among other things we will consider a revision of the main out out outputs of this project maybe organizing some workshops uh, we have new b vertebrate invasive alien species since the list was updated in August this year uh, that could also be considered and we will consider, of, as I mentioned, further dissemination. I was asked to briefly talk as well about non-lethal management of, animal, uh, of animals, uh, invasive alien species. I would like to 
highlight that, as the manual says, most methods available and effective are, in fact, lethal methods. Uh, it is the case that well-planned management uh, and eradication, including through le lethal methods, um, can be effective, particularly at early stages of invasion, when animals are limited, the ones that have to be tackle, tack, tackled are still limited. This avoids suffering of a larger number, number of animals uh, and long-term harm, harm through long-term ne need for control. Of course, there's always the need to keep a balance between humaneness and effectiveness of the measures we take. Uh, Non-lethal me measures also exist, of course. We have fertility control, sterilization. We may keep animals in captivity after capture, but those measures also do have welfare implications. It's something we should not forget. Uh, for example, if you keep an animal in captivity, uh, the harm may persist over the lifetime of, of the animal. If you fence an area, it's a non-lethal measure, but it does have may have welfare implications by leading to artificially high densities of wild animals and it may have fencing has potential impact on non-targeted species. Relocation um, as well may, may result in stress or death, even death for the animal if there are insufficient resources or, or if the habitat that the animal is relocated to is not suitable in the end. So um, by I would like to end by thanking again um, and congratulating the IUCN, the whole consortium, for the uh, successful uh, conduct of, of this project and to thank the, the European Parliament. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. And uh, yeah, we come afterwards to the to the Q and A. Uh, so we go to the second presentation, and I will give the floor to Kevin Smith, who will present a manual and feasible human management measures for vertebrate IAS. You have the floor, please. Yeah, and I close. brilliant. Thank you very much. So, firstly, I'd like also like to thank the intergroup for inviting us to speak, and I think this is a nice completion of the circle. As Juan mentioned, this project was actually a pilot project through the European Parliament, so it, it, it's great that we can be here to present it back. Um, so my name is Kevin Smith. I lead the work on invasive alien species for IUCN, um, and I'm here to talk to you about the, the manual, which was the key output from this project. Okay, so next. But before I do that, I just want to go through a few of the fundamentals. So what is an invasive alien species? Well, they can be animals, plants, fungi, or even microorganisms that are introduced to areas outside of their natural range. This is normally by human intervention. Um, and, which is the critical aspect, they also have negative impacts upon native biodiversity and related ecosystem services. Okay, next. But are all species that get introduced to new areas, are they all invasive alien species? Well, no, they're not. Um, th thank you, perfect. <laughs> Um, in fact, only about between 5 and 20% of species that are introduced actually lead to negative impacts. Now, they are what we term invasive alien species. Next. Another key aspect to understand is what a pathway is. A pathway is the means in which a species or individuals of a species are moved from their native range to, areas, to, to other areas. Now, this can be done intentionally or unintentionally, and there are five broad categories of that, of pathways, from release, so for example, for hunting purposes, escape from gardens, it could be contaminants in imported goods, store away on ships, or even through man-made corridors. Okay, next. What kind of impacts are invasive alien species having in the EU? Well, the IUCN Red List have undertaken European assessments for 21 separate taxonomic and other groups. So you can see here, these are those taxonomic groups that have got the largest impacts from invasive alien species. So this is looking at all freshwater fishes, you know, all shrubs, all birds, all amphibians in the EU. And this shows you that essentially 50% um, of, of freshwater fish that are known to be near threatened or threatened with extinction have invasive alien species as a threat. So you can see from this that there are many different taxonomic groups 
that, have got, uh, that invasive venom species are a major driver of that extinction risk in Europe. Okay, next. This is actually using a new metric developed by IUCN called the Species Threat Abatement and Restoration Metric. It essentially uses the IUCN data and it identifies areas where the greatest opportunities are to reduce those threats. Now, this is just looking at species that are threatened by invasive alien species. So it's showing you where the greatest gains can be made for species conservation. And obviously, it's showing islands. You've got the uh, Azores, Madeira, Canary Islands, and lots of other areas in the Mediterranean. So it's no great surprises, but it's actually very interesting to see where those greatest opportunities can be made by addressing invasive alien species. And it's very relevant in terms of the the EU biodiversity strategy's target on invasive alien species, which says, which aims to decrease the number of red list species threatened by invasive alien species by 50% by 2030. If we want to achieve that, then there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to address invasive alien species. Okay, next. So, the manual, next. <laughs> Sorry, I, th I thought I would have a clicker, but um, unfortunately we don't have them. Um, <clears throat> So the project, um, as Juan mentioned, um, it was a pilot project put through from the European Parliament. It was a three-year project, IUCN with a lead consortium. But one of the real strengths of this project was a broad group of consortium partners that we had. It really is a huge success that we had, you know, the welfare groups, we had European, we had sort of Eurogroup for Animals, the um, European Association for Zoos and Aquaria, the European Alliance for Rescue Centres and Sanctuaries, the UK's Plant and Animal Health Agency, Newcastle University, and, and the the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Invasive Species Specialist Group. So we had a real broad range of stakeholder groups to produce this. Okay, next. As Juan mentioned, animal welfare is set out in the EU Invasive Species Regulation, particularly in relation to the rapid eradication and management, where basically anyone undertaking management needs to ensure that animals are spared any avoidable pain, distress, or suffering. I won't go into too much detail there because Juan's already covered this. Okay, so next. This project targeted the vertebrate species of union concern at the time. So in 2019, there were 22 vertebrate species of union concern, and you can see them here. And just a note that in 2022, so in this year, an additional 11 vertebrate species were added to the union list, and they're not included in this manual. Okay, next. So the project had three phases. The first phase was all about producing the first draft manual. So we, we reviewed welfare policies and guidelines and legislation at a European and international level. We identified the management measures that can be feasibly used on those vertebrate species. We identified a humaneness framework. How are we going to address the humaneness and welfare impacts of those measures? And then we basically assessed each of those measures. We assessed their effectiveness and costs, the welfare impacts, and also their side effects. And then we produced the first manual. Next. Oh, go back. Oh, I see. Okay, so sorry, go back. Okay, so you can't, unfortunately, you can't see the other two phases. Oh, you can just about know. So the second phase was a regional engagement. That's where we ran eight online, because of COVID, eight online stakeholder engagement workshops. We had over 250 people engaging in those workshops, including representation from every country's national authorities, we had it from other stakeholder groups, from hunting associations, welfare groups, academia, NGOs. So we had a real broad range of engagement where through that process, we mobilized case studies on the application of those measures. We reviewed the manual, filled in new information. We identified what the national relevant legislation were in each of the EU member states for invasive species management and their welfare. And then we produced these dissemination plans and the second draft manual. And then the third phase, which is the dissemination, we ran a conference, and we're now in that process of disseminating all the material out, which is, I suppose, why I'm here as well. Next. Okay, so, this is, so the manual, onto the manual itself. The manual has four main parts to it. There's an overview of those international and, and European legislation and guidelines on welfare and what they mean for the management of invasive alien species. We have a toolbox of measures, the humaneness summaries and species accounts. I will come on to those in a little bit more detail. And then we have a number of appendices. This is really where a lot of the detail is. So we have appendices, one appendix for each of the individual measures, 
and that provides all the detail on how to apply those measures, the details on their welfare impacts, their effectiveness, and their costs. And then we have additional, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's okay, go on, move on. We identified 32 measures in eight broad categories. So you can see the eight broad categories here. I'm not gonna go through all the different measures, but the, 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 th the, the categories are really into two different parts. One was really focused on managing the invasive alien species in the field. So things like you know, shooting, trapping, poisons and toxicants. And the other group of measures were those measures that were used to basically um, to remove the individuals once they were captured. As Juan mentioned, it's really important that you look at the welfare impact across the whole time frame of that management. You don't just look at the welfare impact of an individual measure when you manage the species, so you don't just look at the impact of shooting or trapping. You need to look at if you keep it in captivity, how you're going to dispatch the animal, etc. So it's a real string of different measures that are used, and you need to make, consider the welfare impacts and effectiveness across all of those. Okay, so next. The key welfare conclusions of this study. It's really important, really, to strive to apply the measure with the lowest welfare impacts without compromising the effectiveness of the management objective. That's really, really important. I'm going to come on to that in a little bit more detail. We need to take into account the costs, benefits, the feasibility, and public perception. The welfare impacts need to be considered when selecting and applying the management measures, and it needs to be monitored throughout the whole management process with the aim of improving that the welfare impacts the next time it's used. And you also need to consider, again, as, as Juan mentioned, it's really important to consider the welfare impacts subsequent to that management measure. What are going to be the impacts if it is kept in captivity? What are going to be the impacts on, on how you dispatch that animal? Okay, so next. So here we have the classic invasive species invasion curve. Next. This shows you the invasive energy species status across that curve. So you can see here, before the species is introduced, it's absent, it goes from small and localized populations, it spreads until it becomes widespread and abundant. Next. And this shows you the relevant management options that are available to address the impacts from that invas invasive alien species. So you have prevention, early detection, rapid eradication, all the way through to permanent control. Next. But if you look at that in a welfare angle, obviously, the best thing for animal welfare is to focus on prevention. Mm -hmm. Pathway management, biosecurity, you know, public engagement, make sure that those species are not introduced and established in the first place. That is the best for biodiversity, it's the best for welfare, so really you can't stress that enough. If you then look at rapid eradication, it's, it's a time-bound management. So you'll go out and you'll manage the, those individuals until they're gone and then it's over. But, if, if, um, but then if you go through to permanent control or even containment, you end up with permanent control. So this is where it's really critical to focus on um, making sure that the measures you do use are effective. If you choose a measure that's not effective, even if that's due to welfare considerations, mm -hmm. the chances are you end up with a bigger welfare impact because that species is going to spread. You're going to be managing a larger population of individuals or potentially permanently. So it's, it's really important to take from this that it's, it's critical that, to, that you can't compromise the effectiveness of a measure, okay, when selecting them. Okay, next. This is the toolbox of measures. It's the kind of the first point that, that we expect people to go to. It's just a simple matrix that identifies what tip, the types of management measures are known to be available for those different species. So whether they're available, potentially available, or under development. And it also identifies if it's for those different management objectives. Okay, next. So how did we assess the welfare impacts of those different management measures? We used the five domains approach, which was, which was um, kind of published really by Sharp and Saunders in 2011. Humaneness is not, a bi is not a binary thing. Something isn't humane or inhumane. Okay, it's a spectrum, and you're looking at welfare impacts across a whole spectrum. And it looks at different things, from water deprivation, environmental cha changes to the animal, um, the disease and injury, and its changes in behavior, and then obviously the mental components, what kind of fear and anxiety does that animal go under. And then it comes out with an overall welfare impact. And there's also a separate aspect on the mode of death, which kind of looks at how long does that animal, how long does it take for the animal to die? And based on the assessments of those different management measures, using that framework, 
we then provided a score for that. So next. And then in the manual, we summarize that. So for each of the 32 different management measures, we identify, we provide the score that is given for the, all those different domains. We provide a rationale about why we've given it that score. Now, like I said before, there's far more detail on this in those annexes to the manual. Next. This is an example of a species account for Palace Squirrel. And you can see here, basically, it's very hard to see, but essentially it goes through all the different management measures that are available to that species and then identifies their effectiveness. So how effective are those different measures? Have they been used before? And any information on costs? So what we really want is for, manage, is for people who are undertaking and choosing management measures is to look at the welfare impacts, look at the effectiveness information and costs. And this is what Juan mentions the first time that we provided this information together. And it's really important that both are considered. Next. And, and again. So we ran, a, we ran a conference in July in Brussels. Um, we had, again, 125 participants. Again, we also had representatives from every EU member state's national authority and lots of other stakeholder groups. They presented their case studies. We identified future work. And so we've really started that dissemination process. Next. We've produced project brochures. So these are really designed to be used to kind of really raise the issue with relevant decision makers. We've got them for almost every EU language. They're all, um, all available, they're all publicly available now. Some, the, the only reason we don't have some in some languages is because the people that we spoke to in those national authorities said, we don't need it in our own language, English is fine. But, you know, but we have it for almost all of them. Next. So all the, all the manual, the annexes, the brochures, all the dissemination material are all available on the ASIN website, which is the, you know, the, um, the European, so the, yeah, the ASIN website. Um, and then finally, the last slide, the next phase. As Juan mentioned, we really would like to continue this work. There are 11 more vertebrate species on, on, on the union list. The, as Juan also mentioned, national legislation moves on. Management measures are improved, so we really would like to keep on on top of this brochure, the, the, the manual, to make sure that it's kept up to date, and also to keep that the broad consortium that we've brought together. We really like to keep those guys together because it's a really effective group, and it's and it's the only way to really address this issue is by keeping all voices in the same room. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, yes, I will open the floor for questions. Who will start? Caroline was the first. Uh, Caroline, vas-y. Ouais. Uh, merci. Merci, Tilly. Et merci aux intervenants pour vos présentations. On parle aujourd'hui de mesures de gestion. J about what, what they've said. Uh, we heard about management. We heard that there are some inappropriate measures sometimes now I have a question actually many or members of the Commission if you look at the management manual for the invasive vertebrate species looking at well being in the light of the IUCN provisions it's very important not to use means that are negative for the environment now in this context, what I wonder is whether the Commission is thinking possibly of having a list of provisions that might not actually respect these strict provisions on well-being. What kind of decisions will the Commission be taking to ensure that there is a list stipulating which methods would be forbidden because they don't respect animal well-being? Well, thank you very much, Caroline. I'll take a round of questions first of all and then we can move to the replies. Petras. Thank you Chair. Let me to, uh, thank both speakers uh, first of all for excellent presentations and uh, our update on, uh, on this issue. Starting from the uh, Commission's uh, uh, official, uh, may I ask a question, does the Commission foresee ways how to make uh, the risk, uh, uh, risks assessment and review processes of the species and uh, to the EU union list more transparent by sharing all information sources used during the decision-making process. I think it's very important, I mean, because the public, white public, I mean, is really interested in, in this uh, 
um, policy line and wants to be updated as much as possible. And then my, my question is to the uh, next speaker from uh, uh, IUCN. Uh, I wish I were <laughs> same optimistic about the spread of uh, those invasive uh, species uh, to the Baltic region. I mean, it, it was painted in absolutely yellow. Um, but uh, to, to my knowledge, I mean, we are not really so well protected. I mean, I will give you some examples. Uh, as uh, recently, we have reports about raccoons, mushrooms, plants, well spreading, I mean, over the, the, the region. And uh, it's speeding up. Uh, and I see myself in the forest. I mean, it, it, different uh, plants appear every every time. So my question is, I mean, uh, how much it's uh, updated? I mean, how may, uh, you, you mentioned you have uh, a good cooperation and interaction with some local activists and organizations, but is it up to date? I mean, uh, to what extent uh, you really follow the real situation uh, in real time? Thank you. And I will take Anja and Francisco, and then we come to no, yes, and then we come to the answers. Anja, you have the floor. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, both speakers as well uh, for their excellent presentations. Uh, I have uh, two questions for the uh, Commission representative. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the first part of your, your presentation, so maybe I, I missed it. Um, but I was very happy to, to hear you say that it makes uh, sense to, to uh, incorporate preventive measures. And we heard also from, from the IUCN uh, that it is very important to, uh, in this phase. Uh, a few months ago, the European Commission uh, told us that the, that the Commission will uh, study the possibility of an EU-wide positive list. And uh, uh, this was asked for by the, the Parliament several times. And I was wondering, can you tell us something about uh, the status of, of this uh, for an EU-wide positive list for, for pets? Is there already some progress made? Uh, and my, my second question to you is uh, the Invasive Alien Species Regulation uh, has an effect on, on the way that, that wi uh, wildlife managers and the public view individuals and uh, uh, invasive animal species. And uh, they consider them as vermin or pests, and uh, this is contrary to the to the the fact that they are sentient beings, uh, as as uh, uh, the qualification of animals in the treaty of the functioning of the EU. So, uh, I think it should is important that the regulation and management should should include community engagement uh, to raise awareness uh, with a view to foster a positive attitude towards wildlife. Uh, uh, and its humane management, including invasive alien species. Um, so this would, would of course, involve um, uh, accurate information campaigns aimed towards species on the union list to counter uh, negative stereotypes given by hunters and other interested stakeholders. Um, can you tell us a bit about what actions uh, uh, regarding coordinated EU communications campaign does the Commission foresee? Thank you very much, also to you, Anja. And then I have Francisco, and then we come to a first round of, of answers, and then I take other okay. questions too, of course. Yeah, I use this one. It's uh, th three simple questions or direct questions to the last speaker. Um, in the end, you said you wanted to continue the, the project, so uh, I'm here. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's fine. So uh, what do you need to continue the project? So you stated in the end, um, if there's any role uh, in the European Parliament that we can have uh, concretely. Uh, the second one is uh, regarding uh, other factors that might influentiate the, the management of this uh, species. For example, the urbanization. Does this play any role? Because uh, ecosystems now have less and less space due to the growing of urban areas. If this has any impact, then how, how do you assess this? And on little management, what do you do with the animals uh, or plants that are uh, kept? I, I, I can assume that if, uh, vegetable is easier to manage, but animals that, for example, are not hunt to be eaten, what is being done with these animals? They are being management in what way? Uh, so, because in the end, I didn't understand what 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 was the the end of the the cycle. Uh, and so I can assume that hunting for 
them to eat, okay? That's uh, an end of cycle, but the other animals, what? It's the management of, of those things. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. And I give uh, first the floor back to Mr. Juan Perez Lorenzo from the Commission. There were quite some questions addressed to you. Um, yes, I give you the floor. I noted them also, but you have can react to the questions, please. Thank you. Thank you for for the good and, and interesting questions. Uh, I'll take them one by one. Um, first. Um, I think there was a question on, on whether we could uh, publish somehow uh, may, made better known the, the measures that are, that are banned, that the measures that are not be taken. I would say that um, part of this already exists. Um, um, the, there is EU legislation and um, international legislation or agreements to which the EU, the, the EU has subscribed to which already specify um, banned methods. For example, as I mentioned, leghole traps are not permitted in the EU because there's a regulation that says so. Uh, the, the EU is a party to the Bern Convention. It, pro it prohibits some, the Bern Convention has an annex, which some means of killing and capture are prohibited. For example, snares or live decoys for trapping or using artificial light sources. These are reflected to a large extent in the Habitats Directive. Then um, we have the Biocidal Products Regulation, which specify certain um, certain biocides that cannot be used. So um, then, it's we we may try in a in a future in a revision of of the manual or the or in a future revision of the manual to list some of these uh, methods that should not be taken because they're prohibited already. But I would like to highlight that this is in a way it's a bit of a moving target. It's difficult because I'll give you a concrete example. There's a pesticide for killing fish that is used in parts of the world. It's called rotenone and it's quite effective. It's one of the, the most effective methods of of of, addre of addressing fish in uh, addressing addressing invasive in species in aquatic environments which is a medium in which it is very difficult to, to take action. Now, rotenone is banned in most of the EU. It is sometime al sometimes allowed in some member states through some derogations which are difficult to obtain. So any list that we would try and give would be incomplete and not exact and not reflecting really the, the national legislation, but we'll, we'll, we'll consider it. Now, uh, there was a comment on on the need for risk assessments that we undertake. Risk assessments are a step that is necessary to put a species on the union list, on the list of union concern, as you may know, for them to be more transparent. Um, I do not uh, totally agree, of course, with this appreciation because our risk assessments before they, they, are, they go to the scientific forum and while they are still in the scientific forum, which is a body of member state experts, which uh, determines whether they're fit for purpose or not, and then go on to a committee if they're fit for purpose, and the committee votes on, 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 on putting them on the list, before those risk draft risk assessments are all publicly available, and they are available for comment. So anybody who has arguments, uh, who knows that something is missing, uh, may may comment on those drafts, and those are taken into account when revising the, the, the draft risk assessments. Uh, also, before the decision on is is on be, before the vote on the list takes place, um, there's a period for public feedback, and we we analyze the public feedback, and we have to justify why we take we don't take it into account if 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 we don't do so. There was. Um, when it comes to uh, comment on incorporating prevention, which is of course key uh, on positive lists and where we stand on, on positive lists, mm, we are considering it. Uh, the list of union concern is, as you know, a negative list which has restrictions like trade bans, um, etc. So um, it's complex. Uh, a positive list at EU level is complex because it's not clear how such a new regulatory tool will relate to legal 
in legal and practical terms to existing legislation on wildlife trade, on animal health, on the IAS regulation itself. There are concerns about the proportionality of having a blanket ban on on trading or keeping uh, any species that would not be on a positive list at EU level. There are concerns about capacity and resources in member states to make this work. So while some member states have already adopted such lists and uh, the ones that have partial lists at least are facing problems and challenges in court, for example, the Commission does not rule it out and we, we will consider it. Uh, uh, we are still seeing how then our negative list, the list of union concern, is is coming to materializing because it's a relatively new piece of legislation still. So we will consider the positive list, but we do not have uh, immediate plans to put forward such a proposal. Um, then when it comes to the perception, yes, fully agree uh, that uh, invasive alien species are a vermin of, of pests. Uh, 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 they, are, they are sentient beings as well. This is why it's, it's important when, when managing them, managing animals, to do it in, in uh, as much a humane, taking into account their welfare consideration, which, which is what we are discussing to here today. But it is necessary to tackle them, to address them, because otherwise the impacts... Uh, we, we don't want to end up in a world with just cockroaches and crows and rats and, and see our red squirrels disappear, for example. So we have to address them. There is, uh, of course, a need to raise awareness and for community engagement. Actually, the IS regulation obliges uh, to, to have such community engagement and all life projects dealing with IS have awareness raising and community engagement uh, in, in built. Uh, when it comes to what we have done, uh, we do many things. In, in Terrella, we finalized recently, it ran parallel to this project, another project on communication and awareness raising. Uh, it finalized now in October this year. And that was precisely the, the, obje the objective of that project was also run by a consortium. It was an EP pilot project. The objective was to bring together stakeholders uh, competent authorities and the pet industry and the horticulture industry and um, forest uh, operators and uh, uh, to bring them together and to devise awareness raising campaigns. So uh, if you go to the AIRS in uh, website, uh, which is maintained by the Commission's GRC, um, uh, uh, to the AIRS in website that is on Kevin's presentation, you will see there that there is a, l a lot of material, uh, posters, videos, that has been developed by that project, so I invite you to check that out. Thank you. And now uh, I give the, back, the floor back to you, Kevin, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and just to, just to add to what Juan just said there, the, the communications material that were produced through the other contract, which is about the re it's excellent stuff. There's some really, really good communication material that is available for anybody to use. So please do, if you want to support communication within your countries, this, in all the different EU languages, they've got nice videos and they're all addressing those key pathways that we were talking about. Like Juan said, the pet trade, um, there's the, the forests, um, soil transport. So there's some really, really good communication material there for anybody to use. Um, so just coming back to the comments on, on IUCN, I wonder if it's possible to pull my slide quickly back up again at all. Sorry, hi. Okay. Sorry. Is it possible to pull up my slide again, the map? So I, I couldn't, unfortunately, just to respond to your comment on, on the yellow areas in the map. Obviously, I didn't have time to explain in total, but that's fine. In summary, the map that I showed you does not show the distribution of invasive species. It showed the distribution of the threatened native species that are known to be impacted by invasive species, but only those that are threatened at the EU level. So there are lots of gaps in there. So you're absolutely, it was, a, it was well spotted, and, and I knew that, um, that, that, that there are some caveats in that map. So it doesn't, for example, take into consideration taxonomic groups that we haven't assessed by the IUCN Red List, and also those of national conservation concern. So there are, there, there, so, I should have really stressed that those yellow areas does not mean there are no threats from invasive species. What this is showing 
is basically it's built on the distribution of the native species of those taxonomic groups that are assessed on the red list, and they're mostly vertebrates. Um, but there are the shrubs, plants, medicinal plants, plants listed in policy instruments. So those yellow areas, there may well be, we, as we know, as you have rightly pointed out, there are many invasive alien species having significant impacts there, but this map just isn't picking them up. So there are many caveats that need to be explained on that, so thank you. On um, when the red list is being updated, so the, the, like I said, this information is based on the red list, which is very relevant to the biodiversity strategy target. We try and update the red list assessments every 10 years, and there's currently a project called the Pulse Project, which is, which is run by Constantine at the back there, and they are, they are reassessing how many different taxonomic groups are you reassessing? About 12? 11, 11 different. So some of the 11 of those taxonomic groups are being reassessed. So we're going to have updated information, their distributions, their threats, etc. On to my other, on to the other two minutes. We, we do, we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> my, the, other, the other question was, um, what do we need if we want to continue the project? To be blunt, funds. Um, we really just, we have, we have the network, we have the consortium, we have... Um, I, th I think the, the model that we want to apply, so funds would be the key one, really. We can discuss with the Commission on how best to, to implement the project, but in a nutshell, that's really what, what, what we need. Um, and then you also asked what happens... Um, maybe, I didn't mis maybe I misunderstood your question. Um, how we... The, the, there are definitely other factors that drive native species to extinction, and invasive alien species one of them. You mentioned urbanisation being, if I understand you correctly, you're absolutely right, and actually, which is the power of the IUCN Red List, where you can actually see all the different threats that are driving a species to, to be threatened with extinction. Um, and that, this metric here, which is called the STAR metric, actually allows you to weight those threats based on how, the, the, the magnitude of those threats. So you can actually identify which species are being threatened more by invasive species than by pollution or by agricultural expansion. So there are ways of teasing that out. But I, this is the last point. Um, I think you asked what, what happens to the animals after they are killed? Uh, captured. Or captured, or captured? Captured, pardon. Yeah, so the... Le exactly. So the le in terms of the, le the, the lethal measures are also included in this manual. So we don't just look at how to capture or kill the animal in the wild. Once they're caught, we do look at cranial um, compression. We look at um, injection euthanasia. We look at all that. And they are all looked at in exactly the same way using the humaneness framework. So it does... Oh, I see what you mean. What happens to the, to the carcasses? Oh, gosh, I, I'm afraid. That's up to the national authorities. There will be... I'm sure there will be animal health... Um, regulations that they, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question I mean you mentioned kind of hunting for food which is of, sometimes it's used as an incentive for invasive species management but there is also a there's, there's a risk in using an incentive mechanism like food or commercial gain on an invasive species so there's always that to consider but yeah I'm afraid I, I don't know that I'm afraid and I think that's everything, I think. You did great, you did great. I have uh, two other questions. One is um, from the Bureau of Manuela Ripa. I give you the floor. And then Annika uh, also has the floor. Please, we have some few minutes. Thank you to the interpreters already to give us some more minutes more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, unfortunately, Ms. Ripa couldn't be here today, but uh, I will read her question. Uh, some member states, for example Germany, have species that are listed in the Union list and are still subject to their hunting legislation, while other member states are not. Uh, in these, if the hunting legislation takes precedence over the IAS regulation and management, this can create an issue and undermine Recital 25 and Article 19 on prioritization of non-lethal methods and minimization of pain. Can the Commission clarify that the uh, IAS uh, should not be regulated by national hunting legislation, but instead be solely subject to management practices for IAS. Moreover, can the Commission clarify if, when available, the use of non-lethal methods, sh methods should be prioritized? Additionally, does the Commission plan to fund research into effective non-lethal methods, such as fertility control? Another question is regarding raccoons that were already mentioned today. This can be addressed to uh, IUCN. Um, we would like to raise... Um, this question, especially particularly regarding raccoons, because we have received quite a few letters from scientists from Germany claiming that raccoons are not invasive species anymore in Germany, particularly in Eastern Germany in Brandenburg. Uh, should raccoons be maybe removed from the invasive species list? Uh, what is your opinion on this? Thank you. 
Oui, OK, quite a lot of questions. Uh, Annika, you have the floor, please. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci, cher Tilly. Uh, J'aimerais apporter deux contributions. Uh, two comments. First, based on what I've heard, is the fact that the European Commission doesn't aim to regulate new, uh, new pets. I wrote to the Commission to ask if they could put together a very limited list of wild animals that could be pets, pets, but I was a bit upset by the response. They said that this would represent a systematic change and then they weren't in favor of having such changes. Now, Belgium has put in place such positive limits. They're not as strict, but such measures are possible and therefore this would be a significant way to limit importation of new invasive species. My second question is about agricultural products and uh, merchandise. Now, often invasive species are transported in containers. These are often from China. Due to globalization and multiple types of trade, we're seeing more and more risks of importing new invasive species. To limit proliferation, we'll have to more strictly regulate international trade by better monitoring food imports. In conclusion, I'd like to say that we must take steps to address our errors and we should do so without harming animals. Thank you. Claude, first, uh, shortly to the Commission and then also to Kevin Smith again, please. <laughs> Mr. Juan Perez. Yeah, good morning again. Uh, rather complex questions. Thank you for them. So uh, when it comes to uh, varying legislation in the member states, whether species are huntable or not, uh, um, using non-lethal methods or lethal methods, um, uh, the IAS regulation, and rightly so, gives um, leeway to the member states, gives uh, a choice of options on which measures to take. We cannot, uh, the situation is, differs from member state to member states, uh, from project to project. We cannot and must not uh, dictate which measures, which measures, we cannot micromanage the measures the member states uh, take, and, and I, I guess the member states would not have agreed to such a regulation. So they have a choice. For example, Article 19, um, on managing widely spread species uh, states that uh, they have a choice taking into account also cost effectiveness uh, feasibility etc so this this is this is so and it, it, it will not be changed for the time being uh, research on non-lethal methods uh, I, I'm not sure we have done some research in the past uh, is something maybe maybe it has it has done it has um, it has been done. If not, we will consider it, of course. Um, when it comes specifically to the raccoons, although the IUCN was, was going to comment on this, on whether they are invasive or not, they are alien to the EU, clearly, and, and they are invasive. And if there is solid, I mean, uh, a solid risk assessment was made for the raccoon as for other listed species, if there are solid scientific arguments that argue that it is <laughs> it is not invasive, it, that it does not have a, a negative impact uh, on the environment, on other species or ecosystem services. Put it forward. Uh, it's as simple as that. Let let those uh, those um, um, proponents put those arguments for forward. This is all examined in the in the risk assessment, by the way. Um, on the EU regulating new pets and a pos positive list. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult, it's challenging. Um, it's new, some member states are trying them. Um, uh, as I mentioned, some member states are facing challenges, including challenges in court for those uh, positive lists. And f it comes to mind that, for example, Spain has something similar. You cannot import anything uh, unless you can prove through risk assessment that that is not going to have a um, a negative impact. Now, Spain's list, if I'm not mistaken, is co contains about 1,700 uh, species which would be banned from trade. Um, it would be very complex to 
to to come to a to a it's not impossible but it'd be very complex to come to a joint uh, agreed uh, EU list of pests of pets that are allowed um the agriculture and trade is as a pathway for introduction containers uh, yes of course is is a very Growing trade is clearly uh, one of the main pathways for the introduction of, of invasive alien species into the EU. There is a concentration of invasive alien species, for example, close to the main harbours of the EU, Rotterdam, uh, here in Antwerp, etc. So it's, it clearly is having an effect. Uh, so there is a role and there are obligations for for uh, for official controls uh, at EU borders, uh, the capacity to to do so effectively is increasing, and uh, but it is far from perfect. I mean, other parts of the world, clearly Australia and New Zealand, have been uh, looking at this more carefully. Have been because of the problems uh, invasive alien species cause there, and are, are years ahead of us. So we are improving. We are aware, um, and we are working towards a better situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I give the last minute to Kevin Smith. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think Juan really answered the question that kind of came to me on the, on the raccoon, and I would just support exactly what he said. Um, I, I don't really have much more to add to that, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, I, I can't see any, spe any invasive species like a raccoon who builds a population up and is spreading to have no impact. You know, it has to survive in the wild, it has to eat, it has to do things. So, I, I mean, I, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I support exactly what Juan said. And I think that was my only question. Did anybody else ask me a question? I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again for Thank having you. been with us. Very interesting. And uh, just let me conclude with uh, two sentences. Uh, I, I'm wondering, listening to all this, if uh, the real problem is not the invasive alien species, but more the humans uh, behind all that. Huh? Uh, it was tackled by the, the whitelist that we don't have. It was said by the how we are trading. Uh, but it's also the pets we are introducing that we want to have, the exotic ones. So we really need this whitelist, and I hope this resolution will uh, get big support today. We need to do more research on non-lethal management methods and we need also a, a list of prohibited management methods. So there's still a lot we need to do and, and thank you very much to the, um, to the members of the European Parliament to keep on this fight and let me also say that uh, two information we have not only to cross our fingers for the two resolutions that are going to be voted today um, but also in France, there is the vote on the ban corridors today. So I hope there is some chance that it will pass. And also, let me inform you that I got the petition today on the hunting on polar bears, mainly in Canada. It's something else I want to discuss also uh, in the next animal welfare uh, groups that we are going to have in the next future. Let me just say the next session is going to take place in the 15th of December, 9th. 30. Please note already we have one hour and a half that time. I think we really need it. And I'm looking forward to see you all there again. Thank you very much. And thank you to the interpreters. I have a little bit of bad conscience. Thank you.